Good evening. It's Saturday, October 14th. My name is Dave Coker, and this is Talking About Finance. This evening, we're going to talk about something miraculous, about something amazing, about something you all need, if you want it. Because if you want it, it will come. Because if you want it, you can have it. Because if you want it, nobody, absolutely nobody can deny it to you. And what is it, you might ask? Financial security. Some would suggest it's a lofty goal, one that you need help with, help they are willing to give you. Oh, did I say give? I meant sell. Yes, because these charlatans insist you need their help. You need their guidance. You need their wisdom to achieve financial independence when in reality nothing could be further from the truth. You don't need anyone's help to achieve financial independence. The formula is simple. You need to acquire assets, stocks, bonds, property. It doesn't matter what, but all of these assets must pay you to own them. It's a pretty simple formula. It's a pretty simple system. And one you can do without paying someone to help you. You already know the approach. So what's stopping you from executing it? You need to want it. But once you want it, once you want to achieve financial independence, you'll act. And you will act to do it. It's as simple as that. So do you want it? Do you really, really want it? then make it happen. And on that note, let's talk about finance. Another interesting week in the S&P 500, it finished up about 45 basis points, 0.45%. But it was another strange week, considering what's going on globally and in the US. And as I said there, it's a relief rally. Don't get too excited. Although people are betting on a strong finish into October and the fourth quarter. We'll see if that happens. Five sectors moved up on the week. The remaining six sectors finished down for the week. Energy was the clear winner. Consumer discretionary was the clear loser. And it seems like finally that post-pandemic luxury bubble is dead. So now we're into October and I've been negative. But let's see how it all plays out. We've got two wars on, each of which could deliver a short, sharp shock to the markets. So be careful out there, guys. The VIX traded up to 19.33, opened the week at 17.45. We sort of see the VIX, VIX normalizing. So be careful there. The 10-year note closed the week at 4.62%, down two-tenths of 1% on the week and up seven-tenths of 1% year-to-date. Oil closed the week at 87.69, up about 5.9% on the week and up about 9.3% year-to-date. Lots of calls out there for $100 a barrel oil. I get the feeling it's going to happen sooner rather than later. And that second war certainly doesn't help lower global prices much, if at all. And yes, yesterday was Friday, so I bought myself some Bitcoin. Just got to keep stacking those sats, as we say. And as I've told you before, just buy yourself some Bitcoin and never sell it. You'll thank me in a year, three years, five years, ten years. Buy regularly. Buy and never sell. Buy the same amount regularly. Buy and never sell. It doesn't mean you have to buy one Bitcoin every week, one half a Bitcoin, one tenth of one Bitcoin. Put a specific amount of money in every week, every month, every quarter, whatever you're comfortable with. But keep in mind, this money is locked. So let's find out with me and my buddies. Some 50 or so finance professionals from all around the planet talked about last week. Oh gosh, and once again I have to apologize for my poor manners. I need to properly introduce us. We are Global Wall Street. And between Telegram and our personal networks on LinkedIn and WhatsApp, 
We know everyone, absolutely everyone, in global finance. They're literally two connections away. And this week we're reporting from the city of London. We're reporting from Frankfurt. We're in Los Angeles. We're in Chicago. And we're in Rio de Janeiro. We have people everywhere, absolutely everywhere that matters. So let's go. Let's go. Seven slides for seven days. And guys, 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 thank you so much for letting me do this. Making money in the markets is fabulous. And helping others learn how to make money in the markets is even more fabulous. It's fabulouser. Totally awesome. So we start out, ooh, little hit that a little bit too quick there. We start out this evening by talking about Bernie Ecclestone. I don't know what's going on with this guy, right? He had to pay $600 million, $650 million in fraud. It turned out that he didn't declare a trust that contained about $650 million. Now, the reason I'm sort of gobsmacked, as the British say, by this is he had already declared a trust. I, the mind boggles. Oh, oh, and the thing that really bugs me about this is why did Bernie talk to the tax people directly? Now, I've got tax accountants that take care of my affairs with the IRS in the States and Inland Revenue in the UK, and I pay extra so I never have to talk to those guys. Why? Well, it's not that I'm trying to hide anything. My tax affairs are too complicated. I can't answer these questions. If I talk to either one of the tax authorities, they're going to say, why'd you do this? Why not that? And I'm just going to have to defer to my tax people. So I've learned, just pay a little extra so they take care of it for you. And I never talk to the tax people. I get an email from my tax guy saying, we've got this query, we're handling it. And then later I get an email from my tax people saying, we had this query, we handled it. And Bernie decided to talk to the tax people himself. Why? I don't know. I think maybe his tax preparers, his tax attorneys, wouldn't talk to them on his behalf. He instructed them what to say, and they said, whoa, dude, we're not saying that. Yeah, it's a tough one. And yeah, this is real. We're moving into earnings season. And one thing, having been on earnings calls before, there's always this concept of expectations. <laughs> and I used to think of this. This is such a great cartoon. Because he used to think of this whenever someone would say, we're beating expectations. Yeah? Who has expectations? Why are you being mean to them? Why well, expectations are being beaten. But back in reality, this is real, guys. We know there's a lot of people out there that call themselves day traders. Well, yeah, we know they lose money. We know well over 90% of them lose money. Why? Well, this is interesting. This is an actual mug that we found. Someone put on the, on the Telegram channel. It's $17.35. I cut off the bottom where they got the URL and the QR code so you can order it. That's not good. But, hey... One size of know-it-all trader, cutting losses 10%, timing the market 100%. You can't time the market. Woulda, coulda, shoulda, trades that could have been 900%. Hitting bids 100%, market speculation 700%. And then finally, at the end of the day, when you're drinking heavily because you lost money, believing the market is fraudulent. Little side note there at the bottom, self-taught through YouTube videos. Not my videos. I tell people you can't trade. Not a popular view, I realize, but you can't trade. And I say that speaking as a market professional, retired, who spent his entire career either on trading desks or very close to trading desks where I learned retail investors can't trade. Why? Because even professional market uh, traders are only right about 55, 60, 75 percent of the time at the most. Why? You can't trade. It's one thing if you're doing it with somebody else's money. If you're doing it with your own money, you're going to go bankrupt. Why? Well, the 90-90-90 rule. 90% of the traders lose 90% of their capital within 90% of the days of the account opening. Yeah, this is, I don't know if there's any data behind this, but it makes sort of sense. I always see these people boasting on, on social media about how they just started day trading and they're beating it. And they usually get very, very quiet very, very quickly. Why? I suspect they lose very, very much of their money very, very quickly. And that's why they get very, very quiet. It's interesting. We do know this is how you do it, though. 
This dude, down to his last $100, invested it, day traded it. And now he's got 63.47. He's getting rich, isn't he? Well, speaking of rich, this is Peter Schief. If you've never heard of him, he just go on, 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 on Twitter in particular. He's a gold bug, and I, I'm sort of a gold bug myself. I respect very much what he says about gold. I don't believe anything that he says about social media, or pardon me, about Bitcoin on social media at all. Age hasn't been kind to him. Just eight years. Look at the poor dude. Well, that's what you get for beating up Bitcoin incessantly over the past eight years. And gold just sort of trades sideways. It don't do a thing. Now, guys, I make no secret of the fact that I moved 71% of my retirement capital into gold and silver in March of 2019. I expect gold to go much, much higher than it already has from when I bought it. But I also expect Bitcoin to go much, much higher than my average price. Remember, I've been buying it since 2014. So my average price is much lower than market, but Bitcoin's going to go much, much higher. And finally, this is an interesting one. And screenshot this or find the, find the, 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 the uh, graphic and download it yourself. But here what they're doing is they're looking at halvings. Of course, three halvings have already been realized in 2012, 2016, and 2020. The next halving, he's saying April, I put it at, at May 2024. Now, what happens with the halving is the production rate of Bitcoin is cut by 50%. So what happens with a halving is pretty simple. The rate of, of, of creation of Bitcoin is dropped by 50%. If demand remains constant, and it should, if not increase, then the price of Bitcoin should increase. And he's got some very nice quantitative data here. He's got quantitative data reflecting the period of each having 3.6 years, 3.83 years, 3.92 years. He's got the price of Bitcoin going in. He's got the price of Bitcoin during the period and coming out. And you'll notice one thing in particular, that after a halving, Bitcoin never goes below the price of the prior halving. Take a look at the 2015 halving. Take a look at the price it closed out at. That's the low. And Bitcoin traded up from that. It's a very fascinating approach, a very fascinating thing to look at. And yeah, I believe we're going to be in a better position in roughly one year than we are now. You need to own some Bitcoin. Small amounts. Don't put a lot of money in. I never advocate people put a lot of money into Bitcoin at least in one go. As I always tell people, I don't have a lot of money invested in Bitcoin, but I do have a lot of wealth in Bitcoin. Figure it out if that doesn't make any sense to you. Just buy Bitcoin, hold on to Bitcoin, let the price increase build wealth for you. That's it, guys, for me. You're going to have a wonderful night, a fantastic weekend, and we're all going to make buckets of money. Take care, guys.